Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mary Leviota, and I am one of the Oakland County Health Division nurses um, working for Avondale Schools. And along with my colleague, Carrie Quetmeyer, we're um, going to talk about chronic health conditions in students. And the reason for that is um, school districts that don't have nurses um, kind of just sort of punt in terms of how to approach the care of the kids. And while we're with Avondale, we wanted to make sure um, we gave you kind of a sense of what it would be like if we, you had a nurse, which you do until July. So um, this is our uh, attempt to give you some information that may be helpful now and in the future because um, we are seeing more and more students with chronic health conditions. So, um, I have been a school nurse since uh, 2001. I was with Utica Schools and then I worked for the Macomb ISD. And when um, schools don't have nurses on, on the premises, so a nurse for the building, it's more like school nurses function as consultants. And that's what we're doing with Avondale as well, since there's two of us in multiple buildings. Um, but school nursing is a, a real important element for schools to have. Um, unfortunately, Michigan ranks 50th out of the 50 states for school nurse to student ratio. So Michigan, we really struggle. Um, although we have kids with um, the, the four chronic health conditions that we're going to talk about, Carrie and I, and um, the data shows that there's been an increase in kids with food allergies, asthma, seizures, and diabetes to about uh, very close to 30%. And that was in 2016. So we are seeing more kids with these chronic health conditions. And again, it's it's kind of sad in a, in a state that doesn't have nurses to support um, making sure these kids stay, stay safe in schools. Um, so we're going to talk about these four health conditions and how to best approach them um, during the school day. So it's recommended that when a student has any health condition, but you know, the big four, what we're going to talk about today, that they have an individualized health plan. Um, as Carrie and I have been traversing the district, we've, we've looked at some of the health plans and you guys are doing a, a decent job. It would be nice if there were a more formalized approach, though, so that there was um, continuity throughout the district, whereby, you know, we had access to the same asthma plan, same seizure plan, same food allergy plan and same diabetes medical management plan. Um, just in terms of communication, it's nice when there's continuity. So regardless of what school you're working at, um, the same plan would, would be offered. Um, we as a district can provide those plans. Um, I have access to some that are um, best practice that are used you know, state and at, at the state and national levels. So if they're needed, I can um, get those to the school staff. Um, we can also create health plans for any condition that's not one of those big four. So we have kids with everything from cardiac conditions to, um, oh, different kinds of arthritis and all kinds of um, conditions that, that we need to have some medical awareness of during the school day. And so what those health plans do is they, they become the foundation to um, training. Um, training of staff um, on a variety of different things from giving insulin to um, there's a, a seizure medication called diastat to checking blood sugars. You know, school staff are being asked to do all of these things that really technically are, you know, nursing functions. And so um, it's good to have a nurse around because we can't do all of that, but we can certainly provide the training. So that's that's very important. The other thing about the health plan is that they're signed by the physician and the parent, and typically a representative of the school signs them as well. So it, it becomes kind of a contract. Um, and, you know, not to say that our parents are not going to be forthcoming, but oftentimes we don't get accurate information from them, um, or they might write it on a piece of paper. So this becomes a formalized process, again signed by a physician so we know there's an actual diagnosis. So of the four um, major health conditions, um, my feelings are that diabetes is the one that schools need 
the most training on. And it's kind of the one that's, uh, if you will, the scariest for me as a nurse, because, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about the reason why, but bottom line is a child with diabetes can have a low blood sugar. It can happen very fast. And there's no overt uh, physical symptoms that you can see. And so that's why really training for diabetes is like on the top of the priority scale. So I would say if there's a student within Avondale that has type 1 diabetes, um, let's say they, they enroll tomorrow, I would definitely um, get a hold of Carrier or, or me, and we will help you with the process of making sure we have the appropriate documents and the training that follows. I mean, the documents are no good if we don't do training along with it. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit more about diabetes. And this is just a generic overview of diabetes. Certainly, if the child um, with diabetes is very young, you know, kindergarten, first, second grade, even preschool, and they need um, a lot more adult care, uh, there would be a lot more one-on-one -on -one training that goes with that. For example, giving an injection or testing a blood sugar. Um, while Carrie and I are working um, with Avondale Schools, we'd be happy to do that training. Very, very important that we have a healthcare plan. Um, that's really, really important. It's called the Diabetes Medical Management Plan. And there is an effort statewide to have that Diabetes Medical Management Plan be the same everywhere, that all physicians use the same Diabetes Medical Management Plan. Um, Carrie and I did a training back a couple months ago with a state school nurse consultant, and she rolled out that medical management plan that was put together by um, a coalition, a team of people, which included providers, you know, physicians and such that take care of diabetic students. So that would be awesome if we had that diabetes medical management plan that's uniformly used throughout the state. I will say that last week I was in Macomb County and I did not see that plan. Um, I saw another, you know, a plan from the children's hospital doctors, but that's, it's kind of good news because we're moving in the right direction. But this diabetes medical management plan has to be updated every year with any changes. Um, so for example, if the child's in kindergarten, first grade, every year on as the, as the child's in our care, the medical management plan needs to be updated and signed by the healthcare provider. It can be a nurse practitioner, it can be a PA um, or a physician, uh, but it has to be signed. And these are the medical orders. These are these guide our care during the school day. Um, without this, we'll re we really shouldn't legally be giving injections or administering uh, insulin, testing blood sugars, unless we have this diabetes medical management plan. And I know that I've done some um, consulting with Avondale in the past, and I've, I've seen um, that many of the students with diabetes have the medical management plans. But this is just an FYI, in case this is new to you. So what is diabetes? Um, diabetes is chronic, and that means that um, it, it, it never goes away. It's a lifelong condition. Um, and basically, the food that is eaten is not properly converted into energy. Um, and so sugar, the pancreas, it doesn't work and the blood sugar uh, is elevated. And there has been a huge, just like the other chronic health conditions, a huge increase in, in kids with type one diabetes. Type one diabetes is the type of diabetes where the pancreas just stops working altogether. Essentially it just hoops out. Um, and so the student needs insulin which is the um, hormone that the pancreas creates, they need it artificially. Um, and again, um, back when I started working in school nursing, uh, children got insulin before school and after school. But I would say around 2006, um, doctors started to prescribe insulin for every meal um, that kids ate, kind of like when we eat, every time we eat, if we don't have diabetes, our pancreas squirts out insulin. The doctors wanted um, that, you know, for, for kids and adults actually to mimic that. So every time they ate, they would get insulin. And that's way better for their health, of course. Um, however, it put a huge demand on schools 
who do not have nurses because guess what? Kids eat lunch at school and now we have to have people um, trained to give insulin. So that's type one diabetes and that's mostly what um, is our focus in, in the school setting. So um, I mentioned type one, it used to be called juvenile diabetes. Um, and then there's type two and the type two um, used to also be called adult onset but we are seeing more kids with type two. Um, that's where the pancreas works, but it doesn't work very efficiently. So sometimes they need a little extra insulin or sometimes they take oral medications um, to make the pancreas, stimulate the pancreas to work better. Um, type two diabetes is typically related to lifestyle. So, you know, obesity and sedentary lifestyles often contribute to type two where type one diabetes is no relationship to behavior. Um, it's not like they were eating too much sugar and so they got type one diabetes. It's an autoimmune disorder and that as are the other three that we're gonna talk about, but it's where the body attacks itself. And in the case of diabetes, it's the um, endocrine system that basically the beta cells just start to attack themselves and stop functioning. And then the third type is gestational diabetes and that's diabetes um, in pregnancy. So for the most part, the kiddos in our buildings that require us to swoop in and provide support are gonna be the kids with type one. So long-term um, diabetes can cause a lot of body uh, and organ damage from blindness to kidney failure, um, limb amputations, nerve disease, gum disease, stroke, heart disease. If left unmanaged, those high blood sugars can really wreak havoc with the body. And so um, it was a good thing when the doctor started ordering insulin to be given with every meal um, because it really does stave off some of these long-term effects of diabetes. But again, it just put an additional demand on schools that don't have nurses um, to, to manage these kids. So these are some general um, ideas because we, we sometimes when we're in school, we chase these numbers, um, but just some general ideas. now. This will be more specific to the student on their diabetes medical management plan, the numbers, but these are pretty much the same for everyone with a few tweaks, you know, a doctor might, um, you know, change some of these parameters, but a normal blood sugar is typically anything between 100 and 200, a target blood sugar. And that means if it were a perfect world, a target blood sugar is where the docs would like to see uh, a, a blood sugar. On a, especially in a, a diabetic student. Um, do we see that very often? Not really, realistically, but that's, that's what they target for. Um, hypoglycemia, which is the medical name for a low blood sugar, is anything less than 80 um, or 65 if they're having symptoms. And a high blood sugar is everything, anything over 300. And again, you'll, if you have students in your buildings and you look at the, their diabetes medical management plans, they're pretty much the same for, for every kid. Um, but sometimes the doctors, as that little caveat says in the bottom, they might change it. Um, I have not seen that very often. So here's the thing about blood sugars. Um, kids can test their blood sugars really whenever they want. And um, the very best thing for them is to have their glucometer with them. Um, I know in some schools, not, not necessarily in Avondale, but in my travels, um, the, the building principal has wanted to separate the student from their glucometer, keep the glucometer in the clinic while the child's in the classroom. And truthfully, it's, it's best for the glucometer to be with the child. Why? Because if they're feeling uh, any symptoms, they have it right there. They can check their blood sugar and uh, it's immediate. Um, so we don't want that window of time where they have to walk from the classroom to the office because any number of things can happen in between. Um, so when do kids typically test their blood sugars at school? Usually before a meal. Um, and also, like I said, if they're having any signs or symptoms. And they know their own bodies, by and large, even little ones, can ha have a sense of um, when their blood sugars are dropping. Some of them use terms like they're feeling, they feel shaky on the inside but um, sometimes they can't articulate it if they're too young, but they can really test their blood sugar um, anywhere in the building. Again, if that has to happen, Carrie and I are very happy to come 
you know, most kids are able to do it by themselves at very young ages, but we're happy to kind of size up the room, the classroom, if they need to go by a sink, um, those kinds of things. But we've had some situations in, in the course of my career where, you know, parents have gotten upset because they have been separated, the, the child has been separated from the blood um, glucometer. So that's kind of just an FYI. So there are other really awesome technology. And when I have time to update <laughs> the PowerPoint, um, I, I can add some more things. But this is newer, I'd say within the last three, four years. It's called a continuous glucose monitor. And this is really cool because um, there's a little um, transmitter that's placed kind of like it's a, st a sticky thing on the students, usually the abdomen area, and it can monitor their blood sugar continuously. And then the parent, um, there's an app and the parent can see what that blood sugar is from wherever from work. Um, and it, so it provides a lot of comfort to the parent because they know where the kid's blood sugar is at all times. Um, even some school staff, like if the student has a health aid, they've put the um, app on their phone as well. So they don't need to be with the student at all times. Um, so it's, it's a great tool to have, um, but it is important to know that I recommend, and I think most school nurses that if it's, if it's low, you also do a blood glucose check or a real check just to confirm, you know, technology is not foolproof. So we just want to make sure that indeed um, what this is reading out is true. So essentially to keep a blood sugar in balance, it's, it's difficult. And I've got to say for children, it's even more difficult. Why? Because they're growing. Um, so they have all kinds of hormones going on, particularly during puberty. Um, and kids do things like sneak food. Adults do things like sneak food, but um, we see kids, especially when they start to get a little in, into the 10, 11, 12 year old age. So it's just a matter of trying to keep the balance between um, insulin, food, activity, and it's, it, it's a real balancing act. What I like to tell school staff, though, is don't get too caught up in the numbers because anything between 80 and 300, they're really okay unless they're having symptoms. Um, we don't really need to intervene unless it's 80 or less, 300 or higher. And um, again, when we get those health plans, Carrie and I can review them with you and help you understand that a little bit. So insulin is a, is a big hitter. Insulin is a hormone um, and it's normally secreted by the beta cells in the pancreas, like I, I mentioned earlier on. And it's those beta cells that stop working um, when we have type one diabetes. And it must be taken daily. Um, there's ways to store it. And so if we have any questions about that in, in the school setting, you can always ask Carrie and I, um, and it cannot be taken as a pill because it would be destroyed by the stomach. But it's a it's a very um, you have to be very precise in in uh, the dosing of insulin because you can see the two little um, pictures there. But the little insulin syringe, the the calibrations on that are very minute um, between one unit and two unit of in, units of insulin. It's real teeny amount, but that teeny amount can really impact. Um, a person if it's not given accurately. So that's kind of one of the biggest things I think as nurses, um, as Carrie and I can help, just showing you guys how to give insulin and how to draw it up and making sure that the dosing is precise. It's, it's, it's pretty potent. And then we have many, many kids on insulin pumps. And what an insulin pump does is it essentially pumps insulin into the body continuously. And um, that it's the little site there is rotated about every three days. The parent does that. We do not do that in the school setting. Um, the parent does that. Um, but this just means that the student doesn't need to get the injections. When they eat a meal, they put in the carbs. They just kind of um, dial in or plug in the carbs that they've eaten. And the insulin pump squirts out additional insulin to cover the amount of carbohydrates they've ingested. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool. I've seen children as young as three or four um, having an insulin pump on their bodies. Of course, an adult needs to help them, you know, program in the amount of carbohydrates. But what I like to tell school staff is um, an insulin pump doesn't abdicate us of responsibility, 
Um, many times in, in my career, I've heard people say, oh, they're on a pump. You know, like we don't really have to worry about them. We still do because they're getting insulin artificially and they can still have high blood sugars and they can still have low blood sugars. Um, so, but it's, it's better for the student, especially um, just their freedom to be able to eat and then just program in the carbs. Again, depending on their age, it will require staff um, to monitor. So here's the thing with nutrition. Um, we all should be eating healthy, and that's just kind of a given. And um, kids with diabetes are like, no, uh, are like any other kid. They should not be eating tons of sugar and tons of junk food. Um, however, when I first started in school nursing, there was the theory that kids with diabetes should have like sugar-free popsicles. If there were a treat, the parent would provide sugar-free options for the student with diabetes. Now the physicians, and I would say that's been again since about 2006, they've changed the ideology. We cannot be the food police on our kids with diabetes. Um, so they can eat anything. And if there is a cupcake, um, they would be allowed to eat it and they would probably need insulin um, to follow that cupcake. Again, that would all be written in the diabetes medical management plan. And, um, you know, the parents' involvement is necessary because we would need to know the amount of carbs. And that became the new approach to um, treating diabetes as well, is monitoring the carbs and giving insulin based on the carbs. Again, back in the day, it was a lot easier because we used um, a sliding scale. So if a blood sugar was 200, you gave this much. Now it's all specific to the student. Um, in terms of how much they're eating and how much the physician feels um, insulin they need. And there's actually an equation. And if you've worked with kids with diabetes, there's a um, kind of a mathematical equation that needs to take place. Um, but I guess what I, what I really want to push through is there are no forbidden foods. Um, so that's important to know. We can be the food police. Believe me, I've tried it in the past and I've gotten yelled at by many a parent. Um, and an example was a student, a little one, a first grader whose mom gave her gummy bears for snack. She was type 1 diabetic. And after snack, of course, gummy bears are all sugar, her um, blood sugar skyrocketed. And so I just very gently called the parent and said, hey, could we maybe try, you know, um, grapes or cut up an apple or even a cheese stick or something? Or did I get uh, an earful from that mom? And so we really are not allowed. We can give guidance, but um, they can eat pretty much anything, okay? The important thing for school staff to know is that all of us should be exercising, again, common sense. Um, but when a kid with diabetes is active, that could bring the blood sugar down. Now, still, we want them to play in gym, play sports, all that's so important. But know that um, the blood sugar can drop with activity. And so again, in the health plan, it might be written that they need a blood sugar check before gym, um, maybe not, maybe they just get a snack. Um, but the, these are all the little caveats I like to see written into the diabetes medical management plan. Um, and then the other thing is if the blood sugar is high, like anything over 300, they probably should not participate in rigorous activity. Um, they should, they, they need to be monitored and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we know we don't want to, obviously we would never prohibit them from exercising. You know, that's important. Um, just know that um, in, my, in my years as a school nurse, I saw many a blood sugar drop, especially on a warm day after uh, recess and usually little boys because they're very active, not that little girls aren't, but I, I remember many a little boy running around with type one diabetes play coming in after recess, you know, maybe 1 2 o'clock in the afternoon, sweaty, and then their blood sugars um, drop. So it's, it's important we just have a sense of um, what to do should that happen. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about high blood sugars. And remember what I said, anything over 300 is a high blood sugar. And that means we've got to intervene. We as school staff have to do something. Um, again, Technically, by definition, 250 is, is high. We tend to prefer that kids keep their blood sugars not, not over 300, but on the higher side, um, you know, 180, 190, 200 in school as opposed to low. And I'll explain why. Um, but high blood sugars can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe they didn't get enough insulin. 
Um, maybe they didn't, um, maybe they snuck a, a, a Tootsie Roll too, because I've seen that. Um, if they're not feeling well, sometimes that can drive the blood sugar up. Um, and so some of the symptoms are the same symptoms people have prior to being diagnosed with diabetes, where they're very thirsty, their mouth is dry, they have to urinate a lot, um, they might get a little nauseous, fatigued. Um, and truly, if their blood sugars are running high and at a sustained high, it can really affect their, their cognitive abilities, their abilities to learn, obviously, and their academic performance. So anything over 300. And these, this is just a little picture of some of the symptoms that I mentioned. So a student with diabetes, I think all kids really should be allowed to drink water, obviously use the restroom. Um, we can't prohibit, pro prohibit any of that. So if it is high, and again, I'm going to go back to that diabetes medical management plan. We shouldn't, uh, like I said, punt on any of this. This should be written and, and documented very accurately. Um, if it's over 300, we have the student check for ketones, and that means they have to urinate on a, on a test strip. Um, we'd let them drink water, 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 because that will flush their bodies. Um, sometimes we have to give insulin if it's high during the school day, and then they shouldn't have vigorous exercise if they have moderate to large ketones. And I'll explain to you what that means. Um, definitely, I, I always recommend that we let the parent know. Um, call the parent if it's over 300. So ketones, um, so they're a chemical and they're not a good chemical, but they're, they happen when the body starts to break down fat for energy. And um, in, in large amounts, they can cause a lot of havoc with the, with the body, they're, they're, they're toxic. And so I recommend as, and it's written in the diabetes medical management plan that we have these ketone testing strips at school when we have a student with type one diabetes. Oftentimes I've heard parents say, oh, you don't need to do that. Yeah, we do. If it's written in the medical management plan, we've got to have that on the premises. And just a FYI, it's the parents' responsibility to provide the supplies. Um, have we had parents refuse to bring this in? Yes. And so what have we done? We've gone, I, I've had the principal run out to CVS and, and buy the ketone testing strips, just so that we have them. Not that we have to do that here, but just so you know, um, if the parent absolutely refuses, I would ask that the diabetes medical management plan be amended to reflect that, meaning I want the doctor to sign off on it. Um, you know why? Because this gives us criteria. So if that student has a 300 or higher, they pee on the test strip and it shows that purple color like in the, in the slide, that's a sick kid. That child needs to go home get insulin, that child should not remain in school. On the other hand, they can have a 300 blood sugar, pee on the test strip, have no ketones, no symptoms, they're good to go. But once they start breaking down um, the fats and stuff, uh, then we've got you know, a child that needs to be monitored. And we don't have obviously the, the parameters to do that in school. So that's why I like the ketones testing strips because it gives us criteria and then we know what's really going on internally and metabolically with the kid. All right, so low blood sugars are what really does, uh, the low blood sugars do freak me out during the school day. I don't freak out about much, but low blood sugars can be life-threatening. And so I always emphasize to school staff, low means go. Um, if we're gonna worry about a number, let's worry about if it, if it starts going less than 80. Now, the good news is it's very easily remedied. Okay, so um, anything less than 80, we would definitely contact the parent. Um, and it can happen too. I don't want anybody to think anybody's doing anything wrong. It can just happen with these little bodies as they're growing and changing. But maybe they took too much insulin or maybe they, like I said, intense exercise after recess or gym. Um, sometimes kids that have um, a gastro, you know, if they're throwing up, obviously their blood sugars are going to drop. And so I'm hoping that most of our kids can give us some indication of what they feel like when their blood sugars are low. Like I said, I've had little ones say they feel shaky on the inside, um, whatever. I've seen kids that act almost like they're intoxicated, like they're drunk um, when their blood sugars have been low. And I remember a student, he was maybe second, third grade, and 
he started acting really silly. His name was Joseph and he was jumping on one leg and that wasn't his typical behavior. And so um, the teacher said, Joseph, let, let's check your blood sugar. And sure enough, it was low. So um, this is of the, of the greatest immediate danger are these low blood sugars, just so you know. And again, that's why it's so good for them to have their blood checker very close to them because it can happen real quickly, especially in a little body. And again, the, some, the symptoms can be anything shaky, sweaty. You know how you don't you feel when you don't eat lunch or you've missed a meal? A lot of these are, and, and they're almost intensified in somebody with diabetes, anxious, dizzy, um, blurred vision, they get very tired, headache, irritable, like I said, silly almost. Um, so um, those are some of the symptoms. As I mentioned, the treatment is, it's, it's simple. We just give them sugar. And the typical rule of thumb is you give them 15 grams of carbohydrates. And so that, again, is provided by the parent. I recommend that if we have a kid with diabetes in our building, we have like a little box, of, they call it emergency sugar sources in the classroom, um, maybe one um, in the office, depending on how far away it is from the classroom. And this is where Carrie and I can come in uh, to help as well, because we can sort of size up what, where, where the student is most of the time, you know, and again, it varies based on the age, right? A high school kid should have their sugar source on their person, um, and maybe a little one might need more assistance. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a whole different ballgame depending on their age, obviously. Um, truthfully, I, I'll tell you, as a nurse in schools for 21 years, I worry more about the adolescents, middle school and high school, because like most things, they don't they won't, don't want to be different and they don't want to follow the rules and a lot of that's just developmentally um, and so i worry about them the, the the younger students we can kind of keep a handle on a little better but basically it's just if their blood sugar is low they get a 15 grams of carbohydrates it can usually the, those little juice boxes work great some parents give us the glucose tabs starburst um whatever it you know I had a student that had autism and diabetes, and he would only take M&Ms. When his blood sugar was low, he was a little guy. And we were like, that's fine. Even though M&Ms have chocolate and that sort of, um, it doesn't absorb as quickly into the stomach, that was fine because that was all he would do. Um, so anyway, just kind of little tidbits on that. Um, then there's an emergency medication. If you guys see this in your travels, it's called glucagon. And it's an injection, and it's only given if, if a student goes into a coma, low blood sugar, so low that they can't eat or drink. They're unresponsive. Um, and if you have this, call us because we will show you how to administer it. Truthfully, in 21 years, um, we have, in my experience, we have never had to give it. And I, I covered Macomb County for, for several years, um, but we have it available. We almost had to give it a couple of times, but we were able to get sugar into the students. So anyway, just, I want you to see that. And then the other thing about diabetes is field trips. Okay, right now with COVID, we're not going anywhere, but um, our, our kids with diabetes, they should partake in, and legally they're, they're entitled to partake in everything any else other kid does. So when they go on a field trip, they have to have their supplies, but not only that, they have to have somebody who knows how to manage their diabetes. Um, we can always ask the parent to go, but we can't mandate that. Uh, if the parent's working and can't go, there must be somebody who's trained to accompany the student. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a middle school student at one of the Macomb County schools who went to um, Dave and Buster's at the end of the school year, and the mom couldn't go and nobody from the school could go. So I actually hopped over there to Dave and Buster's. It was a slow time for me. But somebody who knows how to help the student should, should accompany them if they're not in the, in the building. And then um, lockdowns, we know we have those. Uh, with the school safety issues, we've got to, this is something we sometimes forget about. Um, they need to have their supplies with them during the lockdown. So just kind of FYI. Um, again, this goes for all of us working in schools and healthcare, but privacy is a huge issue and making sure we maintain that. Um, I like to train, and I know I've talked to Marianne about this, everybody and their uncle, right? Because I think we all 
all of us that work in schools need to know just the basics. Some of us need to know more details, but um, when I worked for a school district um, in Utica, Utica schools, we wanted all the lunchroom supervisors trained and the administration there kind of gave us, there were two nurses at that time, gave us a hard time and said, no, the, the lunchroom supervisors are moms and they're just going to blay up the kids' information, blah, blah. They were concerned that there would be um, a bit, you know, a betrayal of the um, privacy. And, we, you know, we just said, no, I mean, as long as they're employees, they're held to the same standards as everybody. So we finally got them to sign the, a, a release and they, they were trained and they were happy that they were trained because we'd rather know. So just a little thing about HIPAA and FERPA is the school um, privacy, um, which for medical purposes kind of aligns with, with the HIPAA. We just would protect the student's privacy. Now, um, if a student's in a school and has type one diabetes, like I said, anybody that's involved in that student's care, and that, that is the lunchroom supervisors, that is the bus drivers. If you have that student in your care, you, you are accessible to their uh, medical information because in the event they need help, you need to know how to help them. Um, so that's just a little aside. Okay, and now Carrie is going to talk about asthma. Carrie, come on over. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <clears throat> My name is Carrie Quitmeyer, like Mary said, and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about asthma. So what is asthma? Um, it's a chronic condition and it involves the airways in the lungs and it affects air exchange. And here's some um, facts about asthma, some um, interesting facts. So asthma is the leading chronic illness among children and adolescents in the U.S and it accounts for more than 10 million lost school days every year. So asthma is one of the main illness-related reasons that students miss school. So we really wanna make sure that their asthma is under control so that they are productive at school. On average, uh, this statistic really caught me, in a classroom of 30 children, three are likely to have asthma. So that shows you how common this is, and we really wanna be familiar with the um, condition so that we can help these kids learn and keep their asthma under control while they're at school. Uh, low income populations and minorities and children living in inner cities, they definitely have more emergency department visits, more hospitalizations, and more deaths due to asthma than the general population. So just something to keep in mind how it affects different communities. And here are a couple more statistics that even though we um, have research advances, the morbidity rate for asthma is still very high. So asthma affects 6.8 million children and um, 36,000 children miss school each day. And children with asthma miss three times as much school as healthy children do. So these missed absences and um, they can really reduce the child's academic performance. So here's a little um, diagram about the pathology of asthma. So you can see with the normal airway, um, it shows the, the airway is nice and um, the air can get through. And then in the middle, you see the asthmatic airway and you can see the inflammation and that really causes the airway to be narrow. And this is what the airway of an asthmatic looks like all the time. And then if you look on the right, that there's even more inflammation and that opening is even more narrow. And this is when somebody with asthma is having an attack and the air is getting into the lungs and it's getting trapped there and they're having trouble getting that air back out. So that's what happens when somebody's having an asthma attack. That's kind of what it looks like on the inside, um, what their airways look like. So what triggers an asthma attack? So um, there's many different things that can cause this. 
It could be allergens from um, dust or uh, mold, pollens in the air, um, seasonal allergy type issues. Uh, it could be irritants like cigarette smoke or pollution, uh, different cleaning chemicals or sprays that we're using in school or at home. Uh, it could be different medications like aspirin or other uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or it could be sulfites in foods and drinks. Um, some asthma is triggered by cold viruses. So we would call this viral induced asthma. And so sometimes kids only have asthma attacks after they're sick. So they might have to use an inhaler or nebulizer um, after they've been sick. And this is what we call viral induced. And some asthma we call um, physical um, or exercise induced. And this is when there's um, excessive activity, exercise, running, that can trigger an asthma attack as well. And that's when you might hear it called exercise induced. So uh, medications, we use different medications to control asthma. And the most common is inhalers. There are different inhalers. So there's long-term um, control inhalers. And this is something that a student would take daily whether they have any symptoms or not, just to keep their asthma under control. Some of them, you may have heard of Flovent or Singular. Um, Singular is also an oral medication, so maybe they take um, an oral pill every day, and that keeps their asthma um, under control. Now, the other inhalers they might use are Quick Relief, or we call them rescue inhalers. And these inhalers, you will definitely want to have at school if you have an asthmatic child. So this medication is when they are having symptoms and difficulty breathing, and they need some medication to um, help relax the airways so that they can breathe easier. So the rescue inhalers, you definitely want to have at school. Uh, spacers and holding chambers, these are what we use to um, inhale the medication easier. So a spacer is um, kind of a little tube and it connects onto the inhaler and you put the spacer into your mouth to inhale the medication really slowly. And that medication is released and held so that it's not dispersed into the air. And that way the child can breathe in really slowly and get the most of the medication and it's easier to dose the medication as well. Um, a nebulizer, this is a machine that uses a liquid medication and the machine takes that liquid and makes it into a mist. And then what you're doing is breathing this mist in so you could have a um, tube with a mouthpiece or you might have a mask and that's how you're breathing in the medication. With COVID, we are not using nebulizers in school. We're um, discouraging use at school because you're recirculating all that um, air that's going in and out of your mouth and it goes it goes out into the air. Um, so what we want to do if the child uses a nebulizer is have them use it before school and after school if possible. And if they need to use a medication during school, we'd prefer them to use the inhaler with the um, with the chamber, the spacer. So these are some um, signs and symptoms of asthma. Coughing. Um, coughing is very common if you have asthma and it's usually worse uh, first thing in the morning or at night. Uh, wheezing. Wheezing is that kind of whistling or squeaking sound that you hear when a child's breathing, especially when they're breathing out. Sometimes um, it's audible and you, you can hear that wheeze. You can hear it if you use a stethoscope and listen to their lungs, but um, if that airway is really constricting, then you can actually hear that wheezing as well. Um, chest tightness, this could feel like something squeezing or a heaviness on your chest, shortness of breath. So sometimes when kids have asthma, they just can't catch their breath or they feel like they're out of breath. And this is when they're doing normal everyday things. They just feel like they can't get that air out of their lungs. So it's important to remember that with these symptoms, sometimes when they're severe, 
it can definitely be fatal. So we really need to treat these symptoms seriously when you first notice them so that they don't become severe and we really want to keep the asthma under control. So this is first aid for an asthma episode at school. So the first thing when you see a student having difficulty breathing, you want to stay calm because I know that can be very difficult to see. It can, you can freak out very quickly, um, but you want to stay calm. And the first thing you want to do, take the student away from whatever's triggering them to have difficulty breathing. Maybe it's cold air, they're at recess, you bring them inside immediately. Um, if there's something that's been sprayed in the air, take them out of there. Maybe they're middle school and doing some sort of science experiment and something happens to trigger them. Just remove them from the situation, first of all. Um, have them sit upright, open up the lungs um, to help them breathe easier. And when they are breathing, doing this purse lipped breathing, that way they can get the air in and out a little bit easier. You want to follow their medical action plan. And if they use an inhaler or a nebulizer, like I said at school, we're really going to recommend the inhaler. Um, you want to make sure they have access to their inhaler so they can use that um, immediately. So uh, the next thing is calling 911 or going to the emergency without delay. These are some um, serious symptoms when you you want to definitely call 911. If the wheezing gets worse, if you've given them their medication, usually the inhalers act very quickly. They should take effect within 15 minutes. If they are just not getting any better, that rescue inhaler hasn't done the trick, don't delay and definitely call 911. Of course, if you're calling 911, you also want to be calling their parents as well. If the child's lips or fingernails start to turn a blue color, that means they're not getting enough oxygen in their blood, you want to call 911 because that could be very serious as well. If you see their nostrils flaring every time they breathe in, that's a sign that they're having difficulty breathing that we don't want to ignore. Or if you see that, you might not see the skin in the ribs, but at their throat, if it looks like that skin is really stretching tight, it means their lungs are just really having a difficult time. If they are talking or walking at a normal pace and they just can't catch their breath, that would be um, kind of a red flag too. Peak flow meter, that's like a um, portable device that would check their oxygen. That probably, if that's in the red zone also, but you probably won't see that in the schools, I'm guessing. So anyhow, these are all situations where um, you definitely don't want to delay. Um, like I said, let the parents know um, as well because they can help. They know their child the best more than anybody else. And um, we just don't wanna take this lightly. So this is a quick guide to the basics of asthma. And as you can see, we definitely need a medical action plan for all the asthmatics in your classroom. When we're talking about three kids and 30, it's very common, and we definitely want to know which kids have asthma so we can watch for all these signs and symptoms. And next, we're going to talk about food allergies. Okay, so food allergies are also huge, and I know, um, in, in, as Carrie and I have uh, done some building visits, we've we've kind of been asking a little bit about food allergy protocols and, and you guys are doing a, a very nice job. But um, again, if we can if we can help to get everything kind of uniform throughout the district, that would make it a lot easier on, on everybody, including the parents. Um, so it's a huge public health issue. Food allergies are a huge public health, health issue all over, excuse me, the United States. <laughs> okay, um, we know that one in 13 of our kiddos have food allergies. It's very, very common. Excuse me. 
Um, and it's also on the rise. Again, like diabetes, asthma, as Carrie mentioned, food allergies are also on the rise. Um, so the, the, new, the, the new, I think, thing is that we're seeing more kids that are allergic to more than one food. Again, back in the day, um, it, they might be just allergic to peanuts. And that was a huge one or eggs. But now kids are having multiple food allergies at once. And of course, this puts a, a, you know, a huge stress on obviously the, the parent, the student in the school setting. And these are just some um, food allergy statistics in terms of this, the spike in kids that have food allergies. Uh, much like diabetes and asthma, um, food allergies are also, uh, it's an autoimmune reaction, meaning the um, body attacks itself. In the case of diabetes, it's the endocrine system. In the case of asthma, it's the respiratory system. In the case of food allergies, it's the immune system. So um, again, the commonality in all these conditions is they're all autoimmune disorders. So there's a difference between a food intolerance and a food allergy. And we're hearing a lot about gluten, um, gluten intolerance and stuff like that, or milk intolerances. That again would be something that um, if we get a food allergy action plan, um, a health plan, we can discern what's what. Um, you know, many times parents, um, they diagnose or they'll come in and say, you know, my kid can't drink milk. They get an upset tummy. And so we as schools put all these parameters in place. So um, again, it, not that we would ever negate that, but we would want something from a physician giving us um, some guidance. Is this an allergy? Is this an intolerance? What is it? So in case you don't know this, a food allergy, as is diabetes, um, is a disability under the law. And as, as school staff, we know how that kind of ramps it up in terms of all the, all the protections we need to put in place for the student. Some students, um, and again, this varies based on the district, when they have food allergies or diabetes or seizures or asthma, um, the school puts a Section 504 uh, in place um, they are um, governed under the Disabilities Act, and all those kinds of legal things need to be in, in, in um, place as we approach. And actually, we would do anything to keep a student safe. Um, but in my career, I have seen where um, a parent felt as though a district was not keeping her, her child with food allergies safe. Um, they thought they were. Um, they put the student in the cafeteria, they put him against the wall by himself at a little table to eat. So they thought they were keeping him safe. And the parent um, was very upset because she said, you know, you're excluding him from being with his peers. So she went to the Office of Civil Rights and filed a complaint. And um, I, I had to go help, you know, with the superintendent kind of help remediate that. But basically it just boiled down to some, some education and training for the staff. So just so you know, um, this kind of goes along with um, the, the bottom bullet point here, which is that parents, um, they go online and they read and they familiarize themselves with the laws. And um, I, I, you know, I kind of bring this up because I've been involved in some of these things over the course of time, but um, they can go to OCR if they feel as though, just like with special education, that, that their rights are not being uh, attended to. And so that's why I like to um, suggest and kind of why Carrie and I are doing this, that we be proactive as a district and come forward with, here's what we do in Avondale schools. Here's our health plan. Here's our training. Here's the things we have in place so that um, we stay in front of, of every situation. So in Michigan, back in 2014, there was a law passed, um, Public Act 187, that every school, every public school, and that includes charter schools, must have at least two stock EpiPens. And so that might be a little homework assignment. Scope out your building, see where your two stock EpiPens are kept. I'm sure there's someone in the Avondale district that reorders these annually. Um, and then minimally, there must be two employees trained in anaphylaxis response. And um, then if we have to use one of the stock EpiPens, there's a, a document that Michigan Department of Ed we have to send to them. And if you don't have that, I do, um, but we, we can send that out if we ever have to use one of the stock applicants because they want to keep track of that. 
And I have to tell you, I was working in Macomb County when that law passed and that September, so everybody got their stock happy pens like in the spring, that September of 2014, four high school kids in Macomb County were given the stock happy pens. Um, so four lives were saved. One was a high school student, uh, a senior who, um, I don't know, first or second day of school, ate a cookie. And he, you know, grown young man, you know, teenager, he knew better, but he hadn't had a reaction in a long time. So he took the risk and he had an anaphylactic reaction. And it was the principal that gave him um, the EpiPen that saved his life. So that was truly a blessing to have the EpiPens in the buildings. I, I, I know that they've been used all over. Um, so the law came about because, again, we know we have this preponderance of kids with food allergies, but then the really big issue is that 25% of the anaphylactic reactions happen with no previous diagnosis. So the, the student is, you know, eight years old, he's been eating peanut butter since he was a baby or, you know, two or three, and all of a sudden at eight, he's eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the, in the cafeteria, and he goes into anaphylaxis. I'm using that as an example, he had no previous diagnosis, no previous reaction, or it might even be a student. It could be a, a colleague. It could be one of uh, the employees or one of us working in the building. So having them um, on the premises has really been, I think, a, an awesome thing. So when a, when a uh, student has a food allergy, it's partnership. Um, it's not all about the school and making sure everything is all signed, sealed, and delivered. It's everybody that needs to be involved, including the physician, including the family and the parents. And again, these forms that we put put in place are only as good as the training that comes along with them. Because we can stick a form in a binder and you know nobody knows it's there. But it's important that training takes place. And again, while you have Carrie and I, um, it's please use us to provide training on any of these to teaching staff, um, bus drivers, whomever. So um, the top eight food allergens, you can see them in this graphic. Mostly I see tree nuts, peanuts, um, soy, um, we have milk and eggs, and you know, since we don't really um, serve shellfish at school, we don't see much of that, but these are the top allergens. But there are a lot of other foods that can cause reactions, and sometimes we don't even know what the cause is. Um, when this law was passed in 2014, it was recommended, it was not mandated, that schools have some kind of procedure, some kind of um, policy to, if possible, on um, what we do, what do we do in Avondale schools when a student presents with a food allergy? Who does what? Roles and responsibilities. What kind of risk reduction strategies do we use? Um, do we do staff training? And then what's the emerg uh, emergency protocol? Risk reduction strategies are things like, I know one of the buildings Carrie and I visited said they no longer um, use, you know, have birthday treats and stuff like that coming in. That's awesome. That's a risk reduction strategy because you know, I was at a school one time on Halloween and there were these peanut covered donuts out on a table and, you know, candy and sugar everywhere. And I said to the principal, this is a school nurse's nightmare, you know, but the, the I, you know, again, I, the least food we can introduce into the buildings other than for nutritional purposes, meals, the better you know, because of all the risks involved. So... You know, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it, we've got to have a health plan. Um, the health plan guides our care. One of the buildings Carrie and I visited, one of the staff members said, you know, we were getting mixed messages from the parent. The parent said the student was allergic to this. And then we saw the parent provide the student the, you know, food with the allergy in it. And so um, this is kind of why we're thinking, okay, maybe if we had something formalized, then we could say, uh-uh, no, the student cannot eat this in school. Even, even though you brought it in, you told us the child is allergic to you know, nuts. Um, so we don't want those gray areas because it's in those gray areas that accidents happen. Um, so we have a food allergy um, emergency care plan. Some kids with um, food allergies, the parents recommend or the parents ask for a 504. And again, Carrie and I can help you with those. I have sample ones. Um, and IEPs if the uh, student obviously has special needs. So the Food Allergy Action Plan, again, it's student specific. It's kind of like the Diabetes Medical Management Plan. It enhances communication and it's signed by the healthcare provider and updated annually. 
And here's a sample of one that um, is best practice. It's recommended at the state level. I pushed it through a lot of the Macomb County schools. I, when Carrie and I were doing some assessment in the buildings, we, we saw some of you had this in your, um, in your binder. So it's awesome, but it's pretty simple. And again, if we can get more uniformity, it'll just make it a lot easier on everybody. Okay. And then secondly, it's recommended that there be an authorization for medication. So we have the Food Allergy Action Plan, and then we have a, a medication form for the EpiPen signed by the doctor, okay? I sometimes kiddingly call myself the forms police, but I look at my role and Carrie's role as to, yes, keep the students safe, important, and also keep the district protected and keep the school staff um, safe and understanding why they're doing what they're doing and to make sure that everything's kind of legally attended to. So um, medical facts about food allergy. It's, it, and as I mentioned, it's the immune system that overreacts to a food protein. If you think about those eight, the top eight foods, they're high in proteins. They're the things we should be eating if we're watching our carbs, right? Nuts, milk, things like that, cheeses. Um, the thing about food allergies is that even a minuscule amount of the food can cause anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is the severe life-threatening reaction that can lead to death. Um, so even a minuscule amount, and I use this example. Um, you know how when you're eating Cheetos, you get that orange powdery stuff on your fingers? Well, if you're eating a granola bar, you get uh, peanut residue on your fingers, but it's invisible. And so you cannot see that obviously. And if I have, we're eating a granola bar and I was drinking this water and then I, you know, I should be doing this anyway, but I hand this over and the person touches this, they could get the peanut oil residue on their fingers, even a minuscule amount, wipe their eyes. It's a mucous membrane. You know, we know we're not supposed to be touching that because of COVID um, and introduce the allergen into their mucous membrane. So um, that's the thing about the, the hand washing Again, we're doing that with um, COVID anyway, but it's, it's helpful with food allergies as well. So the thing about food allergies is there's no cure. And so these people, these kids on into adulthood have to just try to strictly avoid the food any which way but loose. My brother is allergic to shellfish. And so when we go out to dinner as a family, you know, he has to put that forward to the wait staff. Um, and there are some you know, restaurants that, because in the prep, food prep area, they, he might not eat shrimp, but, you know, maybe they're cooking it alongside the chicken kind of thing. So um, it's, it's something that people with food allergies have to think about every day. So typically the reaction can happen pretty quickly within seconds or minutes, but sometimes it can be delayed. It can be two or four hours later and it can progress. It's not predictable. And what that means is, okay, let's say maybe when they were little, um, when they were two and they had their introduced to peanut butter, they got a rash around their mouth. That doesn't mean that when they're eight and they eat peanut butter, they're going to get a rash. They could go into anaphylaxis and vice versa. Maybe the first time they had an anaphylactic reaction, but then the second time they just get a rash. Nobody knows. And that's the reason why we see so many EpiPens in schools, because the allergists are, are being proactive. We don't know what, what, which um, situation is going to require um, an EpiPen. Now, here's the bottom line. Prompt administration of epinephrine is critical, meaning do not delay. Do not hesitate. Oh, you know what? I didn't bring my EpiPens. Shoot. Um, I'll have to add that at some point. But if you need EpiPen training, it's actually better to do it in the buildings. And um, Carrie and I can come in and you know, show you, we'll talk more about that in this though. But it used to be, um, we, we try Benadryl first and then epinephrine, but now all the allergists are saying go directly to the epinephrine. Okay, so in high school, you know, like I said, I worry more about middle and high schoolers with this too, because they're the ones that are gonna test the limits. They're gonna be more laissez faire about keeping their EpiPen with them. Um, but most teens, are, are pretty good about managing their own allergens. I will say, there, and just a quick anecdotal story, I was at a high school, and this was you know, maybe 15 years ago, and uh, 
a little girl came in, started the school day, and she was starting to blotch up. And somebody in the attendance office said, Mary, come on in here, look at her. And um, she was blotching up, fair skinned, you know, little girl, and her lips were puffing up. And I said, honey, are you allergic to anything? And she said, peanuts. Well, she did not have an EpiPen on her. So I actually broke the law, ran into the clinic, grabbed some other kid's EpiPen, gave it to her. We got her out of there. And what happened is she um, had, they had stopped at Coney Island on the way to school and they had scrambled her eggs in peanut oil. So unbeknownst to her, she had the allergen introduced. Now, just to sort of sum it up, I did not get in trouble. Um, you know, everybody was happy. The child's life was saved. Of course, we don't have to worry about that today because we have stock EpiPens in the buildings. Um, but it's those sneaky ways that the foods get into our kids. That's what we worry about as well. Just like I said, with my brother going out to dinner, we don't, we don't know. So anaphylaxis is the severe life-threatening allergic reaction. Um, and again, it's, it's a type of shock. It can happen quickly, but sometimes it's delayed. And I'll reiterate the high-risk groups are teenagers. If you have a known food allergy, if you've had anaphylaxis in the past, and if you also have asthma. As Carrie mentioned, asthma, um, it's the respiratory system that's very fragile and very reactive. And so if you have asthma and food allergies, those are the kids we put the radar on because those are the ones that are more likely to go into anaphylaxis just because their respiratory systems are already vulnerable. So um, anytime a kid is telling us that they're having symptoms that should be taken seriously, especially if we, have, we know they have a known food allergy. Um, and it, again, depending on their age, they're gonna have different sensations and different terms that they use, but we would never just say, okay, sit over there and you know look away because it can progress really fast. And I just put some slides together that show you some symptoms. This is what anaphylaxis looks like. And on your food allergy action plan, it will tell you that if they're having um, symptoms from two body systems, you know, it'll spell it right out. But I want you to kind of see, if I see any of this, they're getting an EpiPen, especially if we know they have food allergies. This, um, any swelling of the mouth or the mucous membranes and eyes, um, EpiPen. The little girl I gave the EpiPen to at the high school, she had the sensation. She told me that her throat was closing up. So that was, and you know what? I, I, I say it like it was, oh, I just ran to the you know cabinet, got EpiPen. I was nervous. And I'm a nurse for 30 years. I was nervous um, because I knew if I didn't give this EpiPen, this child could die. But I had to do that in my brain. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? And I just said, like what I teach everybody, just do it. Um, so this is the weird one. Now, sometimes they get um, gastrointestinal symptoms. We don't always think of this as, a, as a, uh, a symptoms of anaphylaxis, but it could be. And then um, some, I, I say if they're, to this point, we're in really deep trouble, but we would still give the, um, the EpiPen. We don't want it to get to this, um, but they feel chest tightness and anxiety is huge because they sense that something is going on within their own bodies. So again, we, we want to give the EpiPen, this is, this is too far a progression, um, but these are some of the symptoms that they feel at central nervous system. So we would give an EpiPen. And again, here, I, I, you know, again, I didn't bring my EpiPen, but we can show you hands-on, we can practice. I, I, I have tons of them, we can use them. I want you guys to see what they're like, feel it, play with it, um, but um, it's, it's very easy to do. What it is, it's epinephrine. We have it naturally occurring in our body, same in adrenaline is the other word for it. And it relaxes the lung muscles, constricts the blood vessels, decreases the swelling in the, uh, in the hives, and it stimulates the heart to work better. So it, it, the, the child I gave it to at the high school, she felt relief within seconds. Like I could just see the relief on her face. And then of course the ambulance came. We give them the EpiPen that we just administered and um, off, off they go. So if we ever have to give it. Um, so I want y'all to know, when in doubt, give the EpiPen. Um, it will not hurt them if they did not need it, because again, we have it naturally occurring in our bodies. What they might experience, even if you give it and they needed it, is a little bit of shakiness. Okay, that's, but in essence, you've saved their lives. 
So there are two different sizes. These are the EpiPens that are provided. Right now, they're still provided free to the schools, I believe. Um, so they come in two sizes, an uh, EpiPen Junior and then a regular size. And the juniors are for 33 to 66 pounds. And then any, anybody over that, it gets the regular. So, okay, I've had staff ask me a million times, well, what if I don't know what the kid weighs? Because you're not going to weigh this kid, of course. Always go with the bigger one. So if you're not sure, give them the bigger, the bigger dose. And then there's lots of awesome resources um, on food allergies. And again, if you need hands-on, Carrie and I are here to help you with the, with the training. Okay. And last but not least, we have seizures. <laughs> okay, so the last of our big four health, um, chronic health conditions are seizures. So what is a seizure? So this is a discharge of electrical activity in the brain. So it's an electrical issue and um, it can cause problems with movement, uh, sensation and feeling or with behavior or awareness. So this is a change in the level of consciousness, basically. So when we hear the term epilepsy, um, epilepsy is a chronic disorder and this is the tendency to have recurrent seizures. So we also call it the seizure disorder. Um, this is usually diagnosed if you've had two or more seizures that are at least 24 hours apart and the cause of the seizure can't be identified. So later on, we'll talk about a few different reasons why you could have a seizure. Um, and epilepsy is when we don't know why it's happening and it repeatedly keeps happening. So epilepsy is more common than you think, and here are a few more statistics. So epilepsy affects 2.7 million Americans and 315,000 students in the United States. So um, every year we see 45,000 new cases or more that um, are diagnosed in children. So one in 100 people will develop epilepsy and one in 10 people will have a seizure in their lifetime. So this is a common occurrence and the chances are high that you could see epilepsy in your schools. And you should definitely know if you have a student that um, has had seizures in the past. That's definitely something we want to know and um, keep an eye on. So here's a couple, um, did you know? So there's a couple misconceptions about seizures. So most seizures are not actually medical emergencies. Um, however, if we see it in the school, it can be very scary to witness. Um, students may not be aware that they're having a seizure and they may not remember uh, anything that happened. Epilepsy is not contagious. It's not something that we um, pass to each other. This is, this is an issue in the brain. And it's not a form of mental illness because this is, like I said, um, an electrical issue in, with uh, brain activity. Students almost never die or have brain damage during a seizure. And there's the old wives tale about being able to swallow your tongue and that is false. A student cannot swallow his or her tongue while they're having a seizure. So what causes epilepsy in these seizures? And like I said, um, for 70% of people, it's unknown. We don't know why this happens. Now for the remaining 30%, there are some causes um, that we can pinpoint. So brain trauma could cause a seizure, having a head injury, a brain lesion or a tumor, abnormal growth in the brain could also cause it. Uh, lead poisoning or an infection. So an infection or an inflammation in the brain. So meningitis, encephalitis, measles, those could all cause a seizure to happen. Um, this could happen at birth or just abnormal brain development. Um, 
Also, we can see febrile seizures. So if your temperature rises too quickly, um, you could have a seizure from having a fever as well. Uh, different types of seizures. So there's generalized and those affect the entire brain. And there's a couple different types. There's absent seizures and tonic-clonic, and I'll go through um, what those are and the different symptoms and the difference between those two types of seizures. There's also partial seizures, and that only affects a portion of the brain. And you might have symptoms only related to the part of the brain that was affected. So absent seizures. This is when you have a pause in that um, activity in the brain and you have a blank stare. So these absence seizures could be very brief and just last one to 10 seconds. And it looks like a person is just kind of zoning out. So their face goes blank, they're just staring. Sometimes they do some um, repetitive movements like chewing or maybe their tongue moves funny or maybe they blink. Um, over and over repetitively. And this could happen quite a few times during the day. And sometimes it gets confused and may look like somebody is daydreaming or not paying attention, or maybe that they have ADD. So because it just looks like somebody is just kind of blank zoning out, um, we definitely want to know if a student has a history of seizures. If you have absent seizures, um, nothing needs to be done for this. There's no first aid necessary. So the next one is called the tonic-clonic seizure. Um, you may have also heard it called the grand mal seizure is what we used to say. And this is kind of the, um, the one with the hallmark convulsions. So this is when somebody might lose consciousness and um, fall. So we have to be careful to keep the um, students safe. And this is when you see those convulsions where the arms and the legs kind of stiffen and jerk and um, have that rhythmic movement. Um, there could be shallow breathing and drooling. So we have to be really careful if there's drooling that the student doesn't choke. There could also be a a loss of bowel and bladder control. So um, we have to be careful of that. And occasionally you could see the skin, nails and lips um, turn blue. Maybe their eyes kind of roll back in their head. These seizures usually last one to three minutes, um, usually not very long, but those one to three minutes could feel like a lifetime. Um, usually if the, after the seizure is passed, the student might feel confused or have a headache or be sore or tired. And remember, they might not even be aware that this happened. And afterwards, they could feel extremely embarrassed if their classmates witnessed this happen. So we have to remember to um, really take care to give that student as much privacy as we can and really support them emotionally because they just could really feel that embarrassment. So here's some first aid. This is what we want to do if you see one of these tonic-clonic seizures. First of all, again, stay calm. Like I said, this could be very, very scary to witness. And um, we really want to track the time because we want to know how long the seizure lasted. Normally, they last one to three minutes. But we want to know if this goes on beyond five minutes, that is an emergency. So um, we want to protect the student. The biggest thing when somebody has a seizure, you want to keep the student safe. So if they fall, um, we want to make sure that there's no furniture in the way that they could um, run into while they're jerking. We want to protect their head, cushion their head, um, keep them safe. If they're drooling, turn them on their side so that they're not choking but we never want to restrain them. We wanna be very careful to let them be, but keep them safe while the seizure is happening. After the seizure, stay with the student until they're fully aware of their surroundings, they've fully regained consciousness and um, start to kind of come back, 
come back to the present. Like I said, we want to provide them emotional support, um, give them privacy. Um, and also we want to document the activity too. So we want to keep track of how long this happened because that's very important. So dangerous first date. These are things that we might do that might actually ca cause more harm than good. So we never ever want to put anything into a student's mouth. Um, an old wives tale is you want to bite down on something. It, we don't want to do that. They can't swallow their tongue. Don't um, put anything in their mouth. We don't want to hold, down, hold them down or restrain them. Just keep them safe and protected. We um, don't want to attempt to give them any if they take oral medications for their seizures. Now's not the time to give those to them because they could choke. We don't want to try and give them food or drink while, while this is happening. And then when is a seizure an emergency? So if this is the first time a student has ever had um, a seizure, if we don't have a history of it, if they don't have um, a medical ID bracelet, because um, usually epileptics will have a, an ID bracelet saying this is a uh, condition of theirs, that's an emergency. Like I said, if it lasts for more than five minutes, that again is an emergency. These are all times we want to call 911. And of course, we definitely want the parents to know as well if their um, student ever has a seizure, call the parents right away. If they repeatedly have seizures and they don't regain consciousness, that's an emergency. Or um, if they're having more or it's changing, if the student is hurt, um, if they have another health condition like they're diabetic, or they're pregnant, those are um, emergencies where we wanna seek help. If it occurs in water, that's not gonna be happening at school, but of course drowning could occur. Um, if they don't, if their normal breathing doesn't resume, then that's an emergency. And we wanna make sure that we, um, if they're not breathing, then we wanna activate the CPR. If um, the parents, if you call them, and they say it's an emergency, then you need to call 911 as, as well. So for these reasons, again, we definitely want to have a medical action plan in place so we know exactly what to do with that student if a seizure does happen at school. And um, different things can trigger seizures. So um, flashing lights, hyperventilation, when you're breathing in and out too fast, um, that could trigger it. Some other things, it could be a missed or late medication. So this is the number one reason. If you have a student in your school and they're on a seizure medication, if they don't come to the office for their medication, please call them. We wanna make sure they have um, their meds on time. Stress, anxiety, it could cause it. Um, a lack of sleep, fatigue, hormonal changes, maybe the student is sick alcohol and drug use, um, drug interactions with other medications, overheating, or even a poor diet. There's all types of things that could um, contribute to this. So we want to um, watch out for all those things and just remember that we don't know why this is caused in most people, but we want to definitely be aware if a student is having um, as a seizure disorder. So um, I think that's the last of our big four health conditions in schools. And like Mary said, um, let us know how everything's going. And we would like to have all students with these conditions have a medical action plan in your school.